Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I have just a couple quick announcements. One is that um, we have a new weight loss program starting and we're going to go about this in a very different way with a lot of accountability functions and um, and, and this includes asking people to apply to participate in the program, doing an interview, deciding if somebody's really ready to do this. Um, I have a whole lot of reasons for thinking the way that I think about weight loss right now, most of which are based on the fact that very little of what goes on in weight loss works, so I think we have to do things differently. So if that interests you, if that's a persistent problem for you, you might want to send an email and just hear what I have to say about it. Um, the second thing is that those of you who watch this every week and you're thinking, gosh, I'd like to be in that business, send me an email and let's chat about it. I can send you some information about what we do here. I really have had a lot of time to think about this and I think that part of what we have to do to fix our healthcare system is just to have a lot more people who are literate about health helping other people with health issues. So we do some great, we offer some great training programs here and if you are interested in talking about that, let me know. All right, so I have a lot of things to talk about this week, both today and Thursday. And the first one is, this is a shout out to everybody in New York who cares about health. Um, one of the reasons why healthcare is in such a sorry state is that a few licensed occupations work very hard to protect their turf and title. And in this way, they control the healthcare business. I mean, one of the ways to control healthcare is to control who's allowed to deliver messages about healthcare. So when dietitians and doctors and nurses and um, licensure does serve some purposes, but keeping people who are competent out of business is one of the purposes that it serves. And I've dealt with this personally myself here in Ohio. So if you live in New York and you want to preserve your right to get information from the provider of your choice, or if you are a practitioner, you need to pay attention to this. It's time to get active. Senate Bill 2231 proposes to create a licensure board for dietitians and also to restrict the practices of professionals who are not dietitians. Now the bill does, in all fairness, contain some language which we got inserted into Ohio statutes that allows for something called non-nutritional or non-medical nutrition education. And it's a pretty hefty exemption. But still, the best thing to do is to keep this from progressing so you're not worried about exemptions and trying to figure out how to practice within exemptions and that sort of thing. You really want to kill this before it goes any further. Interestingly enough, as always, doctors are able to do whatever they want. They get no nutrition training in school, but the bill exempts physicians and they can continue making terrible or no dietary recommendations to patients, and that is A-OK. -okay. Now, this is not the first time that such a bill has been introduced in New York. The last time I think it was tried was in 2012, and it failed. And um, one of the reasons why it may have a better chance of passing this time is that the, both chambers, the House and the Senate, started with identical versions of the bill, so they don't have to fight about which version is going to actually become the law. Um, it is easy enough to kill this with a lot of effort, and I'll get to that in just a second, but this has happened in other states. These types of bills have um, been proposed in Colorado, California, Hawaii, and a few other states, and they've been defeated because of huge, with all capital letters, response from consumers and practitioners saying, we don't want this. And I'll tell you what makes lawmakers very, very worried if they think they won't get elected again. That's what they get worried about. So here's what to do about this. Contact your senator. If you're a New York resident, contact your senator or your representative and your representative. And let these elected officials know that you are opposed to this bill and why. Um, find out the committee members. It's your job to do the research it's because you guys live in the state and, and you have the, the biggest incentive to do this. But find out the committee members and send paper letters to each committee member individually saying why you are opposed to this bill. If you need help with writing a letter and all that sort of thing, we can help you about the, you know, do that here. But please, I cannot overemphasize how important it is to send paper letters because lawmakers never see email. I've been in their offices when they'll say, like, what's the response been to this? They'll say, oh, we've had some emails. Some emails might be two and some might be 5,000. But again, what scares lawmakers is that they think they're not going to get reelected. So when they walk into the building and they can't get to their desk because there's a pile of mail that goes all the way up to the ceiling, that is what really makes them pay attention. If they open letter after letter after letter saying, I don't want this. And then tell your friends and get them to write letters too. I mean, this really is about overwhelming 
the, the number of people who want this type of legislation. You've got, what, 3,000 dietitians in New York who want this? Why don't you guys help mobilize 300,000 New Yorkers who don't? And, they'll, and if you do that, believe me, this bill won't pass. So if citizens do their job, bad laws don't get passed or they can get changed. All right, the next thing, um, you've probably heard that one of the definitions of insanity is that you do the same thing again and again and you hope something different is going to happen. Well, here's an example. In spite of the fact that most people in the United States are fully vaccinated, state health departments have reported 150 mumps outbreaks uh, during the period between January 1st, 2016 and June 30th, 2017. 70% of the people who develop mumps have had two uh, MMR doses. Two, not one, but two. So what's going on? Well, sane people might conclude that the mumps vaccine appears not to be quite as effective as we previously thought. But our health officials and the medical profession today are not sane. These are paid salespeople for the drug companies. So, thus, their solution is to add a third dose of MMR for people at risk of developing mumps due to some type of local outbreak. The basis for this, I mean, when I sit and read this stuff at home, if it weren't so serious, I would just burst out laughing. Three epidemiological studies, only one of which yielded, and it was barely yielded, statistical, statistically significant results. The other two studies showed that one month after vaccination with the third dose, antibody titers dropped to near baseline. One month, all right? The CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization and Practices stated that a third dose of MMR has short-term benefits in the case of outbreaks, no serious side effects, and a low rate of minor adverse effects. The ACIP report states that the efficacy rate for two doses of MMR ranged from 31 to 95 percent. That's a pretty big range. It's almost meaningless. Several studies report that the risk of developing mumps increases over time after the second dose. In response to this, and in trying to figure out the solution to this very puzzling problem, which probably you and I could figure out a solution in a nanosecond, don't do this anymore, they decided to conduct surveys of students, parents, universities, colleges, and health departments in order to determine the acceptability of a third MMR dose during a mumps outbreak. Now, the response uh, rate back from the parents and students was really, really low. They, I mean, almost nobody responded. But this is what they reported in their findings. Experts concluded that students and parents place high value on preventing mumps and its complications, as well as preventing the harms associated with the loss of productivity that can occur with mumps and its complications, as well as preventing the harms associated with um, uh, loss of pr productivity that can occur with mumps disease. Experts also concluded students and parents do not have concerns about safety of a third dose of MMR vaccine. Now, I think that's an amazing conclusion to reach from people who don't respond. I mean, again, in a sane world, the whole discussion about this would be different. It's hard to imagine. I mean, I just try to visualize what is going on behind closed doors when a group of supposedly educated people get together to discuss these things. I mean, how, and, and how many doses of vaccine are we going to continue to add? Have you noticed how many boosters there are? Like none of these things work, so you gotta keep having boosters. And then let's think about the current number of vaccines under, under development right now. I checked with the World Health Organization and there are 138 new vaccines under development right now. So if we keep adding boosters to the insane number of vaccinations we're already getting, and even a fraction of those 138 get approved at some point in time, and then we have to have boosters to them, I foresee a period of time where all adults will walk around with an IV drip bag, like you'll wheel your little pole around with you because you have a constant drip of vaccine in the bloodstream to keep you from getting these diseases. I mean, it just is insane. Um, Remember that our authorities aren't sane. They don't represent the best interest in, you know, of us, the American public. They're working for the drug companies, and so they're mindful of drug company interests, not ours. And so I know that this is a difficult issue for those of you who have kids who are trying to sort this out. And uh, just for the record, I'm not anti-vaccine. I did a very long video clip about this at the end of last year, made the article available to anybody who wanted it. And um, I'm not anti-vaccine, I'm pro-evidence. And we just get overwhelming evidence all the time that this is an exercise in ridiculousness and hurting people, this vaccine schedule we have right now. All right, so after all that, let's finish on a happy note, all right? So medical professionals often blame genetics for health conditions ranging from acne to cancer. However, research really shows genes are important, but not the primary determinant of health. 
diet and lifestyle habits are. But it's easier to blame genes, and in doing so, you end up doing two things. It absolves people of personal responsibility, and it turns people into helpless victims since nobody gets to choose their genes. I don't know about you, but I didn't get to pick mine. Well, a growing body of evidence shows that genes aren't the real causes of diseases, but also that people who are genetically predisposed to develop particular conditions benefit even more from diet and lifestyle change than those who are not genetically predisposed. In other words, when trying to reduce your risk of disease or to reverse conditions like obesity, having bad genes becomes an advantage. I know that sounds hard to believe, but just very recently a study was published. Researchers conducted a 20-year follow-up study that included 8,828 women from the Nurses' Health Study, 5,218 men from the Health Professionals' Follow-up Study. They reported, while that it is true that genetics are a factor in the development of obesity, those with high genetic risk were, quote, more susceptible to the beneficial effect of improving diet quality on weight loss. What was most interesting was the association between the number of high-risk alleles in body mass index and body weight. The researchers determined the genetic predisposition for obesity based on 77 genetic variations associated with body mass index. The more risk alleles a participant had in his genetic makeup, the bigger the increase in body mass index and weight. But the same was true in reverse. The more alleles that would predispose somebody to become obese, the more and greater the effect was on changed diet in terms of BM, change in BMI and amount of weight loss. So, um, genetic predisposition, the researchers wrote, is no barrier to successful weight management and no excuse for weak health and policy responses. In other words, healthy habits trump genes. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.